In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 9 of St. John's Gospel, we heard how Jesus angered the religious authorities by healing a blind man on the Sabbath. Not only that, he accused them of being the ones who were truly blind. For those their eyes could function, they purposefully refused to see and to believe. Well, if that annoyed them, he is about to insult and enrage them even more and make them want to stone him to death. For now, John reports that Jesus uses a powerful metaphor to drive the point home. In Palestine, sheep belonging to villagers roamed freely during the day, but were brought into a common enclosure at night to protect them from wild predators. And each morning the shepherd called his sheep from the pen and they would follow him back to good pasture. The sheep would recognise and trust the voice of their own shepherd. They knew him and he knew them. And those in the early church listening to John's Gospel would have picked up all sorts of references that are harder for the modern hearer to recognise. For in this passage there are also references to Genesis and Psalm 23 and the concept of the Good Shepherd. But there are also implicit taunts to the leaders of the day with references drawn from Ezekiel 34 and also Zechariah and Zephaniah, where the leaders of the people were castigated for being bad shepherds who fattened themselves at the expense of the sheep. Selfish, irresponsible and false. Using an oblique, almost riddle approach, the accusation is subtle and requires a certain familiarity with scripture to understand but the barbs would have gone home with the Pharisees and the scribes, for they were being likened to wolves feeding on the people, false prophets who would lead them to ultimate destruction. Whereas Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is even prepared to lay down his life to protect those in his care, he alone will gather them and bring them home to safety. And then he uses a second image. He is not only like the shepherd who leads his flock, but he is also like the gate through which they must pass if they want to reach good pasture. He is the way through, the route to life. Now, having set the scene, I would like to focus in on a very particular section of today's Gospel, in fact, one particular sentence and moreover, just one word within that sentence. It is the following. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And the particular word is abundantly. Well, it sounds wonderful, life abundantly. But if we are not careful, we can be tempted to relegate the word to the sort of vague coziness that advertisers so often employ. Rather like Coca-Cola's, it's the real thing, Nike and just do it, and L'Oreal, because you're worth it. Incidentally, at the end of L'Oreal's advertisements, I'm never quite sure that I should be flattered or insulted, that I'm only worth about 12 euros. But we do the word itself and Christ's teaching a tremendous disservice if we merely like the sound of it and then move on. It requires some thought. In fact, it requires a lifetime of thought. For in that simple word, lies the very core of our existence, the very meaning of our lives. We need to ask just what is life abundantly? The Collins Concise Dictionary gives the first meaning of the word abundant as 
existing in plentiful supply. But Jesus doesn't seem to be guaranteeing us a long life or lots of it or even a plentiful supply of human beings. He is, after all, speaking about life abundantly and not abundant life. But the second meaning of abundance in the dictionary starts to move us closer to the truth. It speaks of fullness or benevolence and gives, as an example, the phrase from the abundance of my heart. In fact, this definition can offer us an important insight. The modern world can all too easily believe that abundance is something on the outside and something that should come to us. Abundant riches, abundant possessions, abundant property. But Jesus is speaking of an abundance of quite a different order. It is an abundance of the interior, an abundance on the inside at the very centre of ourselves. It is an abundance of knowing that we are being truly the person we are meant to be, of feeling at one with oneself and at one with others. Ultimately, it is being at one with God. It is this at one moment, this atonement for which Jesus came. But this abundance of our hearts is not something altogether hidden, for abundance overflows, indeed it must overflow. But it is not some kind of smugness where we walk around with cheesy grins on our faces as if to say, look at me, aren't I special? I'm a Christian. Actually, too much smiling is always a danger. I have to say as a clergyman, before I was ordained, another ordained friend told me, of course you will smile at people with your collar on, but watch out on your day off and out of uniform, because if you carry on smiling at strangers in the street the same way, they'll think you're a complete nutter. So this is a particular form of abundance. It is not an abundance that we show, but an abundance that we share. Life abundantly means to give abundantly, to be generous abundantly, to care abundantly, to help abundantly, to understand abundantly, to sacrifice abundantly, to love abundantly. It means that from the abundance of our hearts we should recklessly, foolishly, disproportionately, indiscriminately overflow. And the wonder and mystery of it is the more we share the abundance, the more abundantly our hearts are filled. For this abundance flows through us and to us. It seeks us out in order that we may seek out others. It fills us in order that we may fill others. It flows to us in order that it might flow from us. It is our calling, our duty and our joy that we should have life abundantly. Let us therefore seek in all that we do with everyone we meet and throughout our lives to be abundant. Amen.